Hi everybody, welcome to our solutions unit. Of course, since we're at the beginning of the unit, let's go to the course organization presentation and see where we are in our overall year of chemistry. So remember that our theme for the year is that matter is made of atoms that interact in interesting ways. We started by talking about large amounts of matter, then we went in and looked at the structure of individual atoms, and in our most recent section of the course, we looked at what happens when we start putting atoms together in compounds, reacting those compounds together, and the energy that's involved. Now we're in the fourth and final major section of our course. And in this section, we're going to look at four different examples of particular types of chemistry, starting with solution chemistry. This is going to involve things like solubility, why some things dissolve and others don't, concentration, how much of a particular solute we can fit into a particular amount of solvent, and what we call colligative properties, which are things like boiling point elevation and freezing point depression for particular solutions. Does this make sense? Sound like fun? All right, let's go back into it. So to start, I thought I might ask you a question. I've got three different types of substances here, tank water, milk, and mud. And this is showing you macroscopic and microscopic pictures of each of them. Only one of them is a solution. Can you figure out which one it is? I bet you can. Yeah, it turns out that it's tank water. Milk and mud are two other kinds of substances that probably seem like they're indistinguishable from solutions to you right now. But as we go in and talk about solutions, you'll probably start to understand why they are in fact different. So let's begin. So a solution is just a special type of mixture. If we remember back to unit two, we talked about the four major types of substances. We had pure substances, and then we had mixtures. Solutions are one type of mixture. They're the homogeneous mixtures. All homogeneous mixtures are solutions, and all solutions are homogeneous mixtures. Because solutions are homogeneous, there are a couple of other properties that you should be aware of. The first is what's called the Tyndall effect, which is the fact that solutions allow light to move through them without scattering that light, which is different than milk or mud. If you try to shine a light through milk or mud, it might get through, but that light will be scattered all over the place. Another thing about solutions is that the components don't settle. If you make a solution and you leave it, at least at the same temperature and pressure that you made it at, the components of that solution will remain in solution and they won't settle out, which is another difference between a solution and something like mud, for instance, where if we leave it over a long period of time, the components absolutely will settle out. Here's a list of some common solutions, and you can see that there are gaseous solutions like air, and even some solid solutions. Metal alloys, for instance, a mixture of one metal in another, is an example of a solid solution. But most solutions, and the ones that we're gonna really be focused on, are liquids. In each case, we have a solvent and a solute. And the solute is the substance that's present in a smaller quantity, and it's typical to say the solute is dissolved in the solvent. The process of dissolving is known as solvation, and this diagram shows you how it works. There are really two major ways that salvation can happen. In the first, you would put some energy into the solute and the solvent in order to expand them, and then mix the expanded versions together, which would cause them to form a solution. The production of metal alloys is a good example of this. The other way, and probably the way that's more common to you, is, is to put the solute and the solvent together and just wait. And in many cases, that will lead to the direct formation of a solution. A good example of this is putting sugar in water. You actually don't have to do anything after you put the sugar in the water for that solution to form, though you can make it happen faster if you start it up. When considering solutions, there are a variety of interesting intermolecular attractive forces that take place. A very common example is what's known as molecule ion attractions, and you can see that here in this diagram. This diagram is showing a particle of solid potassium chloride interacting with water molecules in an aqueous solution. Notice that the negatively charged oxygen poles of the water molecules wind up interacting with the positively charged potassium ions, and the positively charged hydrogen poles wind up interacting with the negatively charged chloride ions. The result is what's commonly referred to as a hydration shell, which is a covering of water molecules surrounding the individual ions and helping to keep those ions in solution. Another thing that you should understand is that the process of solvation is spontaneous. Once you mix the components of the solution together, solvation will occur. Of course, if we're talking about metal alloys, we'll have to get them into the liquid phase first in order to expand them. But for something like this example of two different gases, all you have to do is open the valve and the two gases will mix together to form a solution. In terms of energy, the process of salvation can be exothermic or endothermic. Something like an instant cold pack takes advantage of this. By mixing the water in the pack with the salt, in this case ammonium nitrate, you begin the salvation process, which in the case of ammonium nitrate is an endothermic process. It'll absorb energy from its surroundings, which leads to the cold feeling that you get when you hold that cold pack. Does this make sense? If it doesn't, write down any questions you have about the process of salvation before we move on. The next section of this video is going to talk about solubility. 
Solubility is simply the amount of a solute that can be dissolved in a particular amount of solvent. We're going to start with some qualitative descriptors. A solution can be saturated, it can be unsaturated, or it can be supersaturated. In each case, these terms refer to the amount of the solute dissolved in the solvent. Saturated solutions have the normal maximum amount. Unsaturated solutions have less than the normal maximum amount of solute dissolved in a particular amount of solvent. And supersaturated solutions have more than the normal amount, which probably seems a little bit weird. The way to understand supersaturation is to understand that in order to begin the process of precipitating out the excess solute in a solution, you have to put in an initial input of energy. This is actually used to our advantage in things like hot packs. What you see in this diagram is a hot pack, which is just a super saturated solution of a salt. And by beginning the process by putting in energy by hitting the metal clicker, which you can see by itself over on the left, you begin the precipitation process of all of the excess salt solute. This precipitation process is exothermic, which is what produces the heat that you feel when you use a hot pack like this. So because you need to put in that extra amount of energy, you can get a super saturated state as long as you're very delicate about it and don't put in any additional energy. You need to be familiar with the different factors that affect solubility. The first one is temperature. So with temperature, for solids or liquid solutes, solubility increases with the increased temperature. You can see this on this diagram, which shows a variety of solid solutes being dissolved in aqueous solution. You can see that as the temperature increases, the total amount of the solute that can fit into 100 grams of water increases as well. Gaseous solutes work in reverse. So for gaseous solutes, solubility decreases with temperature. It has to do with the effect of temperature on solids compared to gases. In both cases, as you increase the temperature, you're increasing the average kinetic energy of the molecules. With solids, as we increase the average kinetic energy, we're increasing the total amount of solid that can enter into solution due to increasing the interactions between the solute and the solvent particles. For gases, as we increase the average kinetic energy, we're actually increasing the internal vapor pressure of the solution, which causes more of the gaseous solute particles to enter into the gaseous phase and leave the solution. Our next solubility factor is pressure, which really only affects gases. Increased pressure is going to increase the solubility of the gas, and decreased pressure is going to decrease that solubility. By increasing the pressure that the solution is under, you're moving the atmospheric pressure further away from the vapor pressure of the solution, which is going to decrease the amount of gas particles in the solution that can enter into the gaseous phase and leave the solution. As you decrease the pressure, you're going to move in the opposite direction, bringing the internal pressure of the solution closer to the atmospheric pressure, causing more of the gaseous solute particles to leave. The classic example of this is any carbonated beverage or soda that you may have opened over the course of your lives. By opening the bottle that that soda is in, you've decreased the pressure that the solution is under, which has caused more of the carbon dioxide in the solution to leave the solution and enter into the gaseous phase. Our last solubility factor is the nature of the solute and the solvent. Solutes only dissolve in solvents of similar polarities. The saying here is that like dissolves like. Polar solutes, like sugar, can dissolve in polar solvents, like water. But nonpolar solvents, things like oil, can't dissolve polar or charged solutes. Another way to put this is oil and water don't mix. If you take oil and water and put them together, one will not dissolve in the other. They'll remain separate. That's because the polarity of oil is opposite the polarity of water. So polar solvents can dissolve polar solutes and ionic solutes, because ionic solutes have a charge as well. Nonpolar solvents can only dissolve nonpolar solutes. Does this make sense? If it doesn't, take a moment and write down any questions that you have before we move on. The final thing that we're going to learn how to do here in this video is learn how to use reference table G. Reference table G is just a bunch of solubility curves for particular solutes in aqueous solution at standard pressure. It's got a couple of different uses for us. The first is to quantify the solubility of solutes in 100 grams of water, or 100 milliliters of water, at different temperatures. And the second is to determine the solubility of solutes in other amounts of water using proportions. Let's go and take a look at some examples of using reference table G. This first question is on page four of your unit 10 packet. What is the solubility of potassium nitrate in 100 grams of water at 50 degrees Celsius? Pause the video, try it on your own, and then when you're ready, we'll go through it together. So I see that my question is asking me about potassium nitrate. I'm gonna find the potassium nitrate line on reference table G. This, by the way, is the most common mistake that students make. They read the wrong line off of reference table G. It's really crowded in there. So make sure that you find the right line for the right substance in any reference table G problem. Once I found the potassium nitrate line, I can go to 50 degrees Celsius and then read the total mass that can be dissolved off of the y-axis. For this particular question, I read a value of 84 grams. 
If you wrote down 83 grams or 85 grams, that's not a big deal. If you wrote down 98 grams or 20 grams, that is a big deal. You really want to try to be as accurate as possible when reading graphs like reference table G. Let's look at another problem. This problem is also on page four. What is the solubility of potassium nitrate and 50 grams of water at 50 degrees Celsius? Pause the video, try it on your own, and then when you're ready, we'll go through it together. So reference table G does not talk about 50 grams of water. It only talks about 100 grams of water. That said, I can use a proportion in order to get the answer that I need. I know that 84 grams of potassium nitrate dissolve in 100 grams of water. I can use that in order to solve for the amount of grams of potassium nitrate that dissolve in 50 grams of water by setting up a proportion, cross multiplying, and dividing. In this case, I get 42 grams as my answer. Does that make sense? Let's go and look at one last example of how we can use reference table G in order to answer questions. This is on page five of your unit 10 packet. If 110 grams of potassium nitrate are added to 100 grams of water at 50 degrees Celsius, what kind of solution is produced? Pause the video, try it on your own, and then when you're ready, we'll go through it together. So in order to do this, I need to find the point on reference table G that they're talking about. 110 grams of potassium nitrate, 50 degrees Celsius. When I find that point, I can see that I'm actually above the potassium nitrate line on my graph. Because I'm above, that means that I have more than the normal maximum amount, which means that this is a super saturated solution. If that point was on the line, it would be a saturated solution. And if it was below the line, it would be unsaturated. Here's a follow-up question. How much potassium nitrate should precipitate out of the solution? So pause the video and try this one on your own before we go through it together. So the normal saturation point at 50 degrees Celsius for potassium nitrate is 84 grams, but I have 110 grams dissolved in this particular super saturated solution. Because of that, I can do a little bit of subtraction in order to get my answer. 110 grams minus 84 grams equals 26 grams. So if I caused the excess to precipitate out, I would expect that 26 grams of potassium nitrate would precipitate out of the solution. Does this make sense? If it doesn't, take a moment and write down any questions that you have before we wrap up. Thanks so much for watching our discussion here of solutions. Make sure that you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure that you can describe the characteristics of solutions that were discussed in the first part of this presentation. Also make sure that you can explain the factors that affect solubility and predict how changing those factors, the temperature or the pressure, will affect the solubility of a particular solvent in a solution. Finally, make sure that you can use reference table G to determine the saturation of a solution and do the kinds of math that we discussed in the last part of this presentation. If you can do all those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have. You can always leave them in the comments below the video, or you can always get in touch with me. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.